Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Good friend of mine's an attorney in California named Dennis Beaver, and he writes a column for Kiplingers uh, online about consumer issues quite often. In fact, he's the one who tipped me off the story a while back about the woman who took a car for a test drive at a dealership and the engine blew up during the test drive. And at first, the dealership tried to tell her, hey, that's on you. You were driving. <laughs> so people with consumer issues will contact Dennis and he'll try to walk them through it and do what he can to help them. And he said, Steve, I got a column now about somebody who had a problem with a big appliance. And I had to tell him, I said, that right there is the second most common call I get at my office. So I get calls about cars all day long, new and used cars. And I do lemon loss. So I like the new car calls. Uh, but the next most common thing, it's a toss up between bad RVs or bad home appliances. The number of phone calls I get from people who say, Steve, I just bought a brand new refrigerator, brand new washer, brand new dryer, whatever it might be, a big appliance, often from a big brand name. And I got the thing in, installed, doesn't work, it leaks, it doesn't keep the food cold, it doesn't dry my clothes, whatever it is. Well, it has a warranty. You call the company, they send somebody out. Weirdly, it's almost always a third party company coming out to work on it. It's not somebody from the factory or anything. And the person looks at it, throws a few parts at it, doesn't fix it. And they go through this process. And the weird thing is that under the Lemon Law with an automobile, after so many repair attempts, you can require them to buy the thing back from you. But not so easy with a big appliance because there's a law that covers it, but the law doesn't say what the bright line number of repair attempts is. So I've known people who said, Steve, I bought a extremely expensive refrigerator. Uh, they've been out to fix it six times. I wrote them a letter and they said, well, we need more repair attempts. We're not quite sure. And at what point can you draw the line on that? And I explained to Dennis uh, talking about this a while back. I said, the problem is the manufacturers know that it's such a hassle to do anything beyond just complain that quite often they won't do much for you. And the crazy part is that the dealerships won't help you either. Because if you call the place you bought the appliance from, quite often they go, well, the warranty is with the manufacturer, not with us. And so I'll tell you right now, the last few big appliances I bought, I bought from a local shop. The name of the shop is the guy's first name, comma, you know, apostrophe S, you know, that's the name of the shop. And the guy sells a bunch of different brand names. And I know if I call him, he'll take care of me. Now, I've never needed him on something I bought that went defective, but I know people who have dealt with him and he took care of them. So based on that, I've, I've worked with the guy. I love the guy. And does he cost a little bit more than your than your best buy or your, your Home Depot or Lowe's? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. But he'll also pick up the phone. I can get him on the phone. Good luck getting Mr. Home Depot on the phone. So here's a story that Dennis just wrote. Company flouts product warranty. What happens next? It's from Kiplinger.com. I'll put a link in the description below. It's no secret that the lifespan of major household appliances has shrunk dramatically. Do you remember... When you could buy a Kenmore appliance, put it in your house, and you knew that it would outlive you and probably the house? Not anymore. Not anymore. At one time, you bought a washer-dryer combo, and both appliances would last well over 20 years. Today, you'd be lucky sometimes to see those essential home appliances remain trouble free for a few weeks. In mid-2017, a couple who contacted him, who reside in Southern California, and read this column here in Kiplinger, went shopping for a new washer-dryer. Uh, the husband said they wanted high quality and a long warranty, as we've heard horror stories from people whose machines required extensive repairs just days after the typical one-year warranty expired. So we were customers for over 40 years of a family-owned appliance dealer, like I just described, who recommended an American-made, commercial-grade, top-loader washing machine that, in his opinion, was the best on the market. It came with a promotional warranty that ran for several years. So we took delivery on July 3, 2017. For three and a half years, it worked beautifully until one day they came home and found the laundry room covered in water caused by overfilling that was confirmed by a service technician that was a defect in the machine. Not something they did, the machine was wrong. Thus began one of the most frustrating experiences we've ever had in obtaining effective warranty service as it was an intermittent problem. Didn't always do it. And that's a curse when you have something that doesn't act predictably. So they show us what it does. Well, it doesn't do it all the time. The wash would fill correctly on multiple occasions and then randomly overfill, pouring water all over the laundry room floor. Over the course of about a year and a half, they returned, uh, the, the technician returned to the couple's home, 
trying to repair the washing machine and did a variety of things. Changed a water pressure sensor, replaced the motor, installed a new top tub seal ring, changed the autofill value twice, installed a new idler pulley and belt kit. Didn't fix it. At least nine service visits were made in an effort to fix the washing machine without success. None of that worked. So this was not a phantom problem. And of course, as so often happens, the consumer went online and discovered widespread problems. The manufacturer's got a whole bunch of these out there, consumers complaining about it. And again, they send somebody out, doesn't get fixed. So it was clear this washing machine could not be repaired. And then the final insult. They sent him a bill for the last service call and said, oh, that's no longer under warranty. Now you got to pay us to come out and look at it and fail to repair it. So at that point, the couple contacted Dennis Beaver, a friend of mine who's an attorney who writes for Kiplinger. He then called appliance dealers across the country that carry the same make of washing machine and asked them specifically, what should the dealer and the manufacturer do in a similar situation when it's clear they can't repair their own product. So he spoke, for instance, to one man who's been the CEO of 20 years at a family-owned appliance place in Boston. He had no sympathy for the dealer. You took their money, you made a profit, now take care of the customer. Whether you have a service department or not, somebody has to help the customer. Uh, He underscored when it was clear early on the technician could not repair the washer, the dealer and the manufacturer should have replaced the machine. A couple were sold a defective washing machine, and this had to be remedied. In every instance but one, appliance dealers across the U.S. and Canada, he actually called Canada, <laughs> told Dennis they would take ownership of the problem and replace the customer's washer with a new one, and especially because the person had gone out of their way to get that extra long warranty. So Dennis thought, okay, I've done some research now. I've heard both sides of the story. Well, actually, to get the other side of the story, you contact the manufacturer. So he emailed the manufacturer's general counsel and asked that someone get involved and remedy the problem for this couple. Uh, And no response. No response. By the way, that's the most common thing I hear. People say, I called a dealer. They said, talk to the manufacturer. I called the manufacturer. No response. No response. So never getting a commitment. but, But the owner, the husband, received an email from somebody in customer service that said, your warranty is expired. Sorry, we're done with you. Your warranty expired. And that's one of the things that plays into this, is if you have a one-year warranty and you're complaining at 11 and a half months, they'll ignore you for half a month and then say, oh, your warranty expired. Look how that, look how that worked. So Dennis points out there are variations in state consumer protection laws. But the manufacturer of an appliance under warranty can't just say, oh, too bad, your warranty's expired. Because if they did that, they could just simply ignore you during the entire, it's like running out the clock, right? It's, (laughs) can't just, oh, uh, give us a call back after your warranty's expired. So in most cases, a warranty is automatically extended during the time that the item is unrepaired, Okay. Uh, so keep in mind the Magnus and Moss Warranty Act is the primary statute you'd be speaking about here, where you buy a product that has a warranty given by the manufacturer. And the Magnus and Moss Warranty Act says that if that happens, then you have the right to count on that. And the manufacturer's got to be on the hook for fixing it. If they can't fix it. They got to replace it or buy it back from you. And that's a federal statute. Now you might say, Steve, sounds a lot like the Lemon Law. Why wouldn't you do those cases as well as the Lemon Law? Well, number one, I got a lot of lemon law cases. But number two, the problem with manufacturers of these products is they're all over the country, sometimes all over the world. Each one is different. And I'll tell you right now, I'm based in southeastern Michigan. The big three automakers are all in my backyard, Ford, GM, and Chrysler. I can file lawsuits by throwing them out my window, okay? But if I got to sue LG or Whirlpool, I've never sued them before, I don't think. And, you know... I don't want to get involved in having to file lawsuits against different defendants constantly uh, where I got to like reinvent the wheel. Right now, when I file a lawsuit against GM Ford or Chrysler, if I have to file a lawsuit, uh, I get the same attorney I deal with all the time and we settle these cases quickly. Volume, volume, volume. Uh, but that's one thing. But number two, the weird part is, is that if you go into court and say, I've got a client who's got a defective car, they can't get to and from work uh, and other problems, uh, you know, this is a serious issue. 
Uh, courts often take those very seriously. Uh, when you go into court and say, my client's got a defective, uh, expensive refrigerator, people kind of like, oh, okay. I mean, it's just not seemingly as serious. So over the years, I have handled a few of these, but I discovered that the amount of work that goes into them is disproportionate to the results you get. So the consequences of noncompliance can be costly under the federal Magnuson Moss Warranty Act, which Dennis points out, which could allow you to file a lawsuit and get your attorney fees and court costs reimbursed should you prevail. And it also does allow attorneys general, for instance, to step in and file suit also as a widespread problem. Dennis then emailed the company's general counsel again saying, you know, I understand you just contacted this consumer here in uh, California and you told him that the warranty's expired. Uh, I'm about to do an article for Kiplingers. It's only fair that I get your side of the issue for my article. So let's set up a time for an interview. How's that? Did not get a reply. However, <laughs> the husband got a reply. They offered him a confidential settlement agreement in which the manufacturer would refund his purchase price in addition to tax and delivery charges. That would be a buyback, my friends. So they did buy the product back from him. Didn't replace it, bought it back from him. And he's okay with that. So he said it's a small price to pay for receiving what he was entitled to in the first place. But he got his money back, so presumably he can go out and he can buy another product. I'm a little surprised that the manufacturer didn't contact the dealer and say, hey, do you have something in stock right now that's comparable to what that guy has? And let's just swap him out and keep him as a customer. But you'd be surprised at how short-sighted they can be. So uh, the husband said clearly they had to know their legal obligations. If they'd been up front and as soon as it was clear they could not repair the machine, why not offer me a new washer or a refund? If asked, I would praise their handling of the situation. So why, Mr. Beaver, do you think I was treated this way? He asked. Well, Dennis says, in my experience, companies are well aware of their legal duties, and that's absolutely true. But if they can drag the process out, many consumers will just give up. And uh, I would like to point out something that's so important about this story. He says no one should think that attorney Dennis Beaver, the lawyer, solved this problem. He's actually just Dennis Beaver, the writer, helping readers. Because he's not representing these people. He was simply doing a story, and he asked some questions. But his paralegal observed, and she said, Beave, <laughs> it's the power of the press that made a fair result possible for the couple. And you did it by shining a brilliant light in a dark space, scattering the cockroaches. So I've mentioned before, that a lot of people who call me who are upset about their cars will say, Steve, I've already called Channel 4, I've called Channel 7, I've called Channel 2. I've called all these TV stations, radio stations, newspapers, internet blogs, and I'm contacting you. And they say, uh, you know, can we file a lawsuit? What's going on there? And the problem is that so many people reach out to these news agencies. I've known people, producers for some of these big TV stations, and they say things like, Steve, the number of calls I get every day from somebody who bought a used car, that's a piece of junk, that it's not news anymore. So they don't often do stories about this. But once in a while, they do. And, and in this case, the one that Dennis covered right here is such a prototypical example of the big appliance calls I get, where people say, Steve, I bought this big thing, you know, refrigerator, washer, dryer, whatever it might be, and it's in my house now. And it's one of these things that's too big for you to carry back to the store, right? That's always part of it. And I get these calls and people say, what can I do? And I walk them through what they can do on their own by saying, unfortunately, I don't handle these cases. So, so I can tell you everything you do up the point of getting legal. But I mean, if you want to file your own lawsuit, you can, but they're going to remove it from district, you know, remove it from small claims, put it in district. That's where you file it. So chances are you're not going to get really far on your own filing it unless you're an attorney. So this such a common call I get. But unfortunately, the average person who reads this column is going to go, oh, okay, how did they get this result? Well, they got the result by a writer for a big media outlet sending a couple questions poking at them saying, you know, hey, by the way, aren't there some laws on this? Can I get your side of this before we talk about this publicly? And that is really what did it. So, I wouldn't ever suggest that your first step be to contact the media, only because they get those calls all day long. 
However, if you're lucky enough to get your story into the media, you might get yourself a good result. So I got to salute Dennis for doing this, Dennis Beaver. Uh, he's an attorney in California. And like I said, he writes his column for Kiplinger.com. And it is such a common phone call I get. And so you say, Steve, how would you protect yourself in a situation like this? I would strongly urge you, if you're buying a big appliance, to consider buying it from the local dealer, the one that's Bob's or Carl's or Jim's. Buy it from somebody like that because they're in the neighborhood and they've got more of an incentive to take care of you. If you buy the big appliance from the big box store, okay, the teenager who sells it to you might not be working there tomorrow. And his manager doesn't care that your item is defective. So that's the number one thing I'd suggest. Number two, what I'd suggest you do is document the heck out of it. Meaning that you save your purchase agreement, save all your receipts, and then when it gets work done, document and save paperwork. If a guy comes to look at it and work on it, make sure he gives you a piece of paper to prove he was there. And so that if it ever does come to a point where you're talking to an attorney or a journalist or the company, you can say, I bought it on this date. It was attempted repair this date, this date, this date, and this date. And now it's still defective. What do I do now? Okay, and that'll help you a lot also. So if they see that you're very, very well organized and your story makes sense, uh, they're less likely to try to run the clock out on you as they would be if you send them wacky, discombobulated emails that don't make any sense. So there you go. But I got to thank Dennis for doing such great work for people as, as a journalist. <laughs> He's also an attorney. H. Dennis Beaver, Esquire, for Kiplinger.com. Company, Flouts, Product, Warranty, What Happens Next? There, you got a happy ending. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. Tact is the ability to describe others as they see themselves.